mentioned, I'm talking about process-oriented guided inquiry learning. This is a National Science Foundation project started by uh, Farrell, Moog, and Spencer at Franklin and Marshall College. It was initially set up for the general chemistry class, which tends to have a very high rate of withdrawals and failures. Uh, I, it since has spread to all branches of chemistry in college, and it's spread now to high school chemistry, and they're now applying it in, to mathematics. So this has kind of been a, a growing project. And it's a learning, active learning method, which I think is now the new buzzword, so that you're getting the students involved in their learning process. So I think we're all aware that we can't take the knowledge we have in our head and just put it exactly as is in the head of our student. I and mean, I know we wish we all could because then they would all have A's, but uh, we tell, when we are lecturing and we give them information, they are figuring out how to interpret that information and how to remember it. And what we don't realize sometimes is that they have a lot of misconceptions about m material they learned previously. And so they are misunderstanding what you are telling them because of this misconception. And you are completely unaware of these misconceptions um, simply because they're ones you wouldn't even have thought of. There's an example from this paper up here where we have two things in chemistry called an instantaneous dipole and a dipole moment. And they're very different things. And students were getting confused about them because they're like, well, isn't instant and moment the same thing? And to a chemist, where instantaneous dipole is one object and dipole moment is another object, you forget that instant and moment have similar meanings because the objects themselves are so very different that it never occurs to you that that might be a misunderstanding to the student. So this method was developed to try and overcome some of that and get past the misconceptions and have the students figure out what their misconceptions are and work through them. So the way the Pogo method works is students work in groups of three to four students during the lecture time. There is no lecture during the class. The students have worksheets that they work on during the class time. And the worksheets are not just a set of homework problems. They are specially written to show, work the students through the knowledge they should be learning and develop concepts for themselves. Um, if you're interested in seeing an example of a worksheet, I have handouts for the round table discussion. It is the worksheet that's given the first day of general chemistry. I didn't want to bring the one from the first day of organic because that assumes you already know general chemistry. Uh, so this one starts with um, assuming you have no knowledge of chemistry. And in the worksheet, you learn what makes up an atom and how to tell what's going to be an atom based on the formula that you're given. And rather than the teacher saying, okay, this is how you calculate the charge of an atom, the student given, is given information and they figure out for themselves what the equation is to calculate the charge. And the idea is, is because they had to figure it out themselves, they understand it better and they learn it better. And they remember it longer. Uh, and so the activities use the learning cycle, which I'll talk about some more um, in just a couple slides, but it involves exploration, concept invention, application. So, uh, and you keep repeating the cycle. And the idea of working in the groups is that the students are teaching each other and themselves. So the student who thinks they understand the material gets to explain it to the students in their group who don't. And if you, all of us being teachers know that you really know if you know something the first time you have to explain it to somebody else. Uh, and then it's also quite interesting that within the group, there's not always one person who knows the answer. So even the student who may always be lagging behind the other students in the group will occasionally be the one to understand the question. And so they're all working together. And then, so the role of the instructor, is the instructor still has a role, <laughs> uh, is that you're there for them to ask questions. So as they go through the worksheet, you know, they get stuck, they, you're there to answer questions. But again, because we're trying to get them to construct the knowledge for themselves, you don't go up there and start giving them a mini lecture. 
you go up there and you ask them a question to try and figure out where they're stuck and get them to work through the process themselves. You, you ask leading questions, so you're a facilitator. Outcomes of using this, using the worksheets, is that the students are actively engaged. I no longer have students falling asleep in my class, which is one nice thing. And um, so as I said, they're discovering the concepts themselves. They're not just given a list of stuff to memorize. So this is my favorite part from organic chemistry, is that there's a reduction in memorization. Because organic chemistry tends to be taught as a list of reactions. So you memorize the list of reactions, you take the test, you forget the list of reactions. And that's how I was taught it, and I forgot it, and I had to relearn it all when I first started teaching organic chemistry. And I'm like, I do not want to teach that way. You're not really learning. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why I went to this method. Um, sorry. Uh, not only are they doing active learning, the guided inquiry part, so the process um, oriented means that they are le learning other skills other than just chemistry. So they're learning how to critically think, communicate, do teamwork. They have management because they have to get through the worksheet during the class time. So they have to learn how to pace themselves, know when they need to ask for help. And then self-assessment, am I really understanding this material? Uh, I should say one of the other things that they learn is to form study groups outside of class. It's amazing to me how many students don't know to do this. They, um, but by working in groups, inside the classroom, they take that outside the classroom and form study groups outside the classroom. And so I've polled my students. I've asked, you know, how many of you stu used study groups before? And it's maybe a fifth of the class. And I ask them, how many of you will now use study groups? And it's probably three-fourths of the class. So I think that's another good thing they take away from this is just um, how to use study groups to help with their learning. So this is um, more of what a worksheet is like. So they're given a model which contains information. They're then asked straightforward questions, just are they correctly reading the model? It doesn't ask them to conclude anything. It's just, you know, they're given a picture of atom. How many protons are in that atom? And they just count the dots and so to get the answer. So it's straightforward questions, but then you start asking them to make conclusions based on those questions that they've just seen. Like, how would I calculate the charge on an atom? And so they come up with that equation on their own. Um, the also part is that learning is wrought with effort, frustration, and error. So students do get frustrated because they have these misconceptions, and so their answers aren't fitting with the questions you're asking, and so they have to reform these uh, ideas they have into the correct ideas to be able to get the correct answer. And a lot of times students will have a wrong answer for one question, but as they go through the worksheet, when they get to a later question, they'll be like, okay, I can't answer this based on what I said before. What I said before must be wrong, so I have to go back and redo that question. And so this way they work through uh, relearning material that they mislearned before and learning the new material. And then the application is done outside the classroom. So they do the reading and the homework outside the classroom to reinforce what they've just learned. I have my homework due um, before class, just before class, um, and it's on the material they covered the previous class. So I don't have large homework assignments that are due periodically throughout the semester, they have homework due almost every class day to make sure that they are reinforcing that material. Uh, each work worksheet also has a section with exercises that are meant to be done after class as well. For the rest of the time, I'm just going to give some quick outcomes. So this is data on how the POGO system works. So this is Franklin and Marshall College. This is general chemistry. These are the men who started this um, Pogel, and this is over a nine-year period, and you can see that the DF and Ws were reduced by 12% by going to this worksheet method, and that you have an increase then in the A's and the B's. C stayed about the same. So the Pogel method, you're getting the students involved. 
they're learning not only the material, but they're learning when they're confused. And they don't like being confused, and so they'll work at trying to understand that material. This is also an indication that maybe your worksheet isn't that good if the students are all getting confused. This is from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. They actually use a mixed pogol and lecture in the organic series. So part of the class time is lecture, part of the class time is a worksheet. So this is a quiz given at the start of the second semester of organic on the material from first semester. So this is, they've had Christmas break to forget it. That's, you know, three weeks. And in the lecture method, 60% oh, have already forgotten half of what they've learned. And this was the, when I saw this slide, this was like, okay, this is what I need to do. Because only 25% have forgotten half when you do the Pogo method. And I want my students to be remembering and understanding what they learned. I mean, it's actually helpful. I have a lot of pre-med students in my class. They're gonna be taking the MCAT or whatever other test you have to get into some health field. And there's an organic chemistry section, so it would be beneficial for them if they remember the material. This is from my own class. So the green bars are when I was teaching organic with lecture, and then the red is when I started using Pogol. And these were identical final exams. There are slight differences. And the A's and B's, there wasn't that much change, but there was a significant shift in the students who scored in the 30s and 40s and 50s to scoring in the 60s and 70s. So I really took those students who weren't doing so well and have moved them up into passing range. I also should say that when I do, when I teach, I exempt students who have a 97 or higher exam average because I figure they would have to fail the final to lose their A. Um, and I had a lot more students who qualified for being exempt when I was using Pogo than when I was just lecturing. This is one other thing that I've shown, um, seen from my class, is that how useful they find the worksheets is very related to how well they like their group. So group composition is also something important to consider when using this method. And they find, um, research has shown that probably the most important thing in group composition is to have different levels of understanding and learning. These are my exam scores. If you just look at the last column, that's the average. Fall 2005 was lecture. Fall 2006 was my first time using the worksheet, so I think I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but then the next three years, you see that I've increased my test averages by 10%. And in the spring, uh, 2006 was lecture. Nine and 10 were Pogel. And again, I see a big increase in my exam scores. So. If you want to know more about this, I do have a discussion roundtable. Thank you.